Today, she is helping people around the world, not only to achieve better health, not only to improve their lives, but she's helping people to know Jesus. She is Joy Kaufman. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is Our Conversation. Joy Kaufman, thanks so much for being here. I'm thrilled you're here. Thanks for taking your time. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. It's a great privilege. I can't wait to dig into this, what, is, what I think is a fantastic story. So well, let's start with talking about you. Where, where are you from? Where did you spring up? Let's go kind of back to the beginning with Joy. So I'm a Colorado mountain girl. Okay. And I grew up in a family that had lots of animals. Yeah. And my grandparents were farmers in Indiana, so we made the trek out there every summer. What'd they farm? Oh, uh, corn, beans, and wheat. There you go. Okay. And actually, my grandpa did corn, beans, and wheat two times, and then he let the ground rest for the seventh year. And I never asked him why, because I wasn't a Sabbath oh, keeper. interesting. But yeah, in hindsight, I'm like, hmm, I want to ask him that. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. So you got around, you're in the flatland, you're in the high country. So, I mean, were you a, a skier? Did you did you climb mountains? Were you, were you that outdoorsy? We were definitely mountain climbers. Yeah. We were a little too frugal to ski. Plus, I had an older brother that played basketball. So all winter long, I sat in bleachers instead. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's So you were mountain climbing and, and breathing the clean Colorado air. And, yes, backpacking. Yeah. And I loved nature. I loved animals. So much so that when I was eight years old, I started to get a gag reflex where I couldn't swallow meat because I would think of the animal. How interesting, really, when you were eight? Yes. And so at nine, I declared I was going to be a vegetarian. I'd never met one. Wow. And my grandpa my grandmothers were absolutely horrified that sure. I was going to become malnourished. Scandalized. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I recall my, my father, when my brother became a vegetarian, very foreign to the rest of our family. He was absolutely convinced that son of yours is going to die. Right. Yeah, he exactly. didn't. He turned up pretty well. Worked out good. Today, you run an international organization dedicated to the well-being of people, particularly children, but people of all age. You have introduced people to the gospel in country after country after country. But we'll get to that. It's a fantastic story. So you grew up in Colorado. And then what did you do? You go to school someplace? Yes. Well, 10 years after becoming a vegetarian and my grandmother's thinking I was going to be some st sickly, stunted child, Sure. I ended up going to Virginia Tech on a college volleyball scholarship. Oh, fantastic. And I realized that nutrition was a major that I could study. Uh, that's a long way from home. Yes, it was. Well, did you have any misgivings about going so far from home when there were perfectly good universities in Colorado? Honestly, I fell in love with the Blue Ridge Mountains. You did? Yes. And Virginia Tech is quite a school. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it was a great As school. As you played volleyball for, for Virginia Tech. Yes, back uh -huh. in the day. Well, no. <laughs> I couldn't prove it on the court today, but... <laughs> uh, no, no, none of us can prove it on the court today, but back in the day, we were, yes. we were all pretty good. So there you were playing volleyball. Did you have success? Yeah, I, I was pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I got to play, and then I, I have to say, when I finally was clear that I was done with volleyball uh -huh. before my senior year. I just felt like I've given so much of my life to the sport, but what I really want to do is go overseas. And I had some program that I wanted to do in the summer, and I, I really wanted to go get trained as a missionary. And the coach, I remember she, she, she told me that I was like this modern day Mother Teresa. How about that? That's fun. <laughs> and it was so funny because at the time I was like, I wanted her to compliment my volleyball skills. But instead, she said that, and as I've reflected on that later in life, I thought I'd rather be that. That's, yeah, that's probably better, right? So, what was your what was your church background? Were you raised in a in a, in a family of churchgoers? Definitely, yeah. uh, it was a non denominational church, mm -hmm. a, a big sort of um, I don't know, five hundred people or so. Yeah, and yeah, it, it was a good Bible believing church, and but it was like a one off kind of thing. Yeah, so then, sure. when I went to college, I couldn't actually find a church that was in the same brand. Yeah. So, what do you do? What are you, a, a teenager, going off to college, and you got to and you got to find a church home? Did you? I, I hopped around yeah. actually during college, and then at a certain point, I my passion for the poor. I had gotten exposed to hunger issues and poverty issues and people without water and sanitation when I was in high school, and so I had yeah. this passion for the poor. And it was interesting because I realized the only college group, Christian group on campus that shared that passion was the Catholics. Sure. So I started hanging out with the Catholics. 
That's different from a from a, a religious practice point of view. Yeah, yeah, it was quite different, and I I appreciated a lot of their convictions, but I also had some misgivings about other things. So I never had any interest in becoming Catholic, although I kind of wanted to become a nun. Uh, you did? <laughs> yes, I think it was the Sound of Music, you know, and <laughs> you see Maria. Although her fun starts when she stopped being a nun. But yeah, true enough. Anyway, yeah. But I didn't go down that path, but I still think there should be sort of an order of some sort for, you, for single people that just want to consecrate themselves to the Lord. You, you, you were clearly drawn to service and serving, which is really interesting given where you are today. So after Vartek, what'd you do? So I went straight off to Romania and I worked in some orphanages. Look that was that. 1993, just a few years after the wall had fallen down. The orphanages, I, I, I have friends who were in orphanages right around that time. I don't know what your experience was, but they were not for the faint of heart, those uh, orphanages. It was traumatic, actually. I came, I came through the experience just honestly so brokenhearted. And fortunately, I had a friend, I was there for four months, and that was my second semester of my senior year. And I had a friend that I met up with her family in, in Europe afterwards. And I went to a retreat center there where I took like a quiet retreat. It was a place called Taze in France. Mm -hmm. And I just had this quiet time and I was pouring my heart out to the Lord saying, you know, why would you allow like all these kids to suffer? Mm. And this voice finally after like three days came to me and I felt like God said, you know, you're suffering, you saw their suffering, you experienced their suffering, but think how much more I feel it. Oh yeah. And I was like, whoa, like yeah. God feels everybody's suffering. Yes, he does. And it was like, I don't know, it, it somehow it released me from the burden of the suffering and activated me towards wanting to take action. Oh, that's interesting. So now I'm, I, I have to ask about your parents because I'm, I'm the parents of a college student right now. And if she got to the end of her you know, it's the end of college, and, and she said, oh, by the way, what were you studying at Virginia Tech? Nutrition, uh, with a focus in international development. If, if she said, I'm, I'm checking out to go to an orphanage in Europe, actually, I'd probably be okay with it, to be honest with you. <laughs> but uh, may, maybe parents would wonder, and, and they, they were happy to see you go proud, or did they say, um, <clears throat> honey, you've got this university thing to finish with first? Yeah, no, actually, I, I finished my university degree. I graduated the semester early because of the missionary training there we go. I got credit for in the summer. And then, yeah, they were both really happy. And my mom had actually started a nonprofit on, it was called Children's Services International when I was a little girl. And so she kind of knew the nonprofit world. And actually, if I'm honest, she helped me get my first job in Romania. Oh, fantastic. So she was very, yeah. she, very happy. So you went there, that was short term, and right. you, were, you were gearing up. In your mind, you were saying, after school, I'm gonna go and do what? What was your plan? I wanted to go just in <laughs> malnutrition throughout the world. <laughs> oh, is that so? Which yes. is fascinating, <laughs> because years later, God brings you right around to that same thing. Yes. It's interesting, you place that burden in your heart, and it just worked itself out. Yes. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you, after, after college, you went on and got some other academic qualifications. I did. I went from Romania to Brazil, lived in a favela, and that's a whole other story. But then eventually God brought me home, and home became Washington, D.C. I worked uh -huh. at a food bank and then ran a kitchen for homeless men in a shelter in D.C. Wow. And then realized I wanted to get a master's because I just felt like I had more to learn. So I went on and I applied to Johns Hopkins University and praise the Lord, <laughs> got in well, and graduated with a master's in public health. Oh, fantastic. An MPH from Johns Hopkins would speak loudly, I would think. It has opened a lot of doors. Yeah. Yes. Oh, quite a school. Uh, I don't want to sidetrack myself, but I just have to ask you, so what was that academic environment like? Or what was the environment like studying at a place like Johns Hopkins? Well, it was incredibly intimidating at the was start. It? <laughs> yeah, like most of my classmates were doctors and I was just like scared, honestly. And then after a few semesters when I just applied myself and the Lord blessed and I got good grades and everything, I realized that they weren't necessarily smarter than me, they'd just been in school a lot longer. Uh -huh. And so somehow I just just kept at it and God really, I mean, blessed and I ended up graduating magna cum laude. Oh, wow. But it was so stimulating because a lot of my classmates had worked all over the world and they had been in like refugee camps and 
they were, you know, doctors without borders, doctors yeah, and yeah. people running like maternal and child health care for Yemen was one of my friends who, yeah, and they were from all over the world. It was a fascinating group of people. And I learned as much from them as from the teachers. I would think so. You, you can't be in an environment like that without something rubbing off, right? Without being inspired, having, having, let me ask you this. So when you are there getting your master's, were you aware, and maybe the answer is yes, but were you aware of the broad scope, the, 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 the great possibilities? I think many young people, um, their futures are stunted because they simply don't know all the opportunities. When you were there, did you, did you already have a sense of what I could do and where I could go, or did that really open up your eyes? Oh, it absolutely opened up my eyes. It like did. I didn't even know that public health was a degree until like six months before. And it was just, you know, meeting somebody. And I so encourage people, pour yourself out into young people and mm. expose them to what the possibilities are and how they can change the world. Mm. Because, you know, they're not, they're, they don't know what they don't know. And sadly, a lot of people, maybe young people, are spending more time, you know, on their phones or whatever, you know, yeah. draining their brain as opposed to thinking about how God can use them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now you lead an international organization named Farm Stew. Tell me what Farm Stew does. Well, Farm Stew is a training program that allows people to have confidence in the Word of God because it meets their practical needs. And so essentially we're designed to develop people who can help themselves prevent hunger, disease, and poverty. Okay. So rather than giving someone a fish, you're teaching them to fish. Exactly. But yeah. the vegan version, we're teaching yeah, them yeah, how to yeah. farm. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Right. But we're not necessarily vegan. We're plant-based. And, and if a malnourished child needs a fish or an egg or something, yeah. we're not going to take that out of their mouth. Sure, sure. That's, that's very wise and very balanced. So, okay, I've got to ask you about the name, Farm Stew. Okay, so I'm one day while I'm studying with Adventists. So in my early 40s, I got exposed to Adventists and I started learning about this health message mm. and how it gave seven to 10 years additional life to this certain population of people. Right. And here I've studied at Hopkins. I've never heard of such a thing. It's, it's actually phenomenal. People take it for granted, but it's almost unbelievable. But is, you know, the it? research is all there to back it up. So you have to believe it. Yeah. So I thought, how is that happening? You know, and so I started getting exposed to things like New Start or in East Africa, they have celebrations or Creation Health. And I started thinking, wow, that's such a clever idea. Like eight principles, they're just simple concepts. And yet when applied, they can make a huge difference. Yeah. So honestly, one day I was after church and I'm reading literature on my kid's trampoline, <laughs> my girl's trampoline, I'm just getting my little vitamin D dose out in the sun. And I was reading and I just started, you know, closing my eyes and thinking, what would a message be for the poor, for the people that God has called me to serve? What would they need? So somehow the letters just started coming together yeah. and voila, farm stew. <laughs> Question. For the people God has called me to serve. Mm. How do you know God had called you? And how do you know, and how did you know, or did you know who he'd called you? Talk to me about your understanding, and you, maybe it was a growing understanding, that God has placed a call on your life. Okay, so this is an amazing story. I'll try to tell the short version. But so my dad in high school, he had been really kind of went oh, through a hard time. My parents actually separated and it was ended in a divorce and my dad got depressed and he was a man of faith and he reached out to God and God said, care for water for the poor. And he didn't know what that meant. And as he researched, he ended up going to a conference in Puerto Rico where he got exposed to the fact that at the time, two billion people on the planet didn't have water. Right. So that was kind of in the back of my mind. He ended up bringing me to a conference in Denver when I was in high school. And it was the first time I realized that people didn't have water or sanitation. So and I want to derail you here, but what a fantastic thing for a dad to do for his teenage kid, right? Honestly, I was so sort of like, you know, fairly affluent, kind of entitled, had no imagination that people couldn't turn on the faucet. You know, yeah. I, I, I thought we should turn up the heat and you yeah. know, run all the water we wanted. Sure. And, yeah. and, you know, he was always like conserving it. And I, you know, as a teenager, it was a good reality check when I realized that yeah. there's people without. So anyway, uh, so I went to college with that in mind. And then one night when I was, it was at my spring break of my junior year, 
and I was at a friend's house and I was laying in bed and I'd been really praying about what to do and actually trying to decide if I should stop playing volleyball or not. And I was all curled up in bed, all cozy in the blanket, and I heard the Lord say, get up and read your Bible. And I was like, I'm too tired, you know? I didn't really want to. And I heard it again. It was kind of like that Samuel, Samuel, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> and I heard it again and I thought, okay, I really don't want to just get up and like hunt and peck and try to find something inspiring. I've done that before. Yeah. So I thought, I'm not going to get up, God, unless you tell me what to read. And sure enough, I heard this voice that said Isaiah 58, 8. And the reason I know it's God, and I can say this with such confidence, is that I was a Christian, but I was relatively biblically ignorant. Mm. And I'm kind of embarrassed to confess, but I will, that I didn't know Isaiah was a book in the Bible. So I had to go to the table of contents, look in the table of contents, see if Isaiah was a book in the Bible, try to find <laughs> where it was. And then lo and behold, I was shocked when there was 58 chapters, because that's a lot of chapters. That's a lot of chapters. Most oh, yeah. books don't even have 58 chapters. Yeah. So I'm like, Isaiah 58, 8. And it's such a beautiful promise, but it's a conditional promise. And the, the promise says, then your light will shine above you. I, I paraphrase it in my own way because there's so many versions, but basically the light of God will come above you. Your healing will spring up quickly. His glory and righteousness will go before you mm. and he will have your rear guard. And so I use hand motions because then he says, you will cry to him and he, God of the universe, will say, here I am. That's right. So it's like, it's the most amazing promise because you're just absolutely surrounded by God. But it's a then promise. So you have to look at what's the if. Yes. So the if, and that's looking at the whole chapter, which by the way, Sister White says is the chapter of highest importance. She says the same thing about Isaiah 58 as she says about the three angels' message. Uh. And the if is that you share your bread with the hungry, that you help the oppressed go free, that you, you know, care for the prisoner and the orphan. And, like basically everybody that God wants us to, that Jesus says in his mission statement in Luke 4, those are the people that, that we are, not just me personally, but the whole church is called to serve. Mm. So when I say that God called me to serve, I feel like that was my commissioning. Yeah. And I was about, I think, 21 years old. And I've, I've really known that call ever since. Now, that doesn't mean that the, the next day you started Farm Stew. There, there were some intervening <laughs> years, so and marriage years. and work and home and raising kids and all, and, and lots of great, great stuff. And, and, I'm, and I'm not trying to say that in that time you didn't do any of that. No, but, but there was years I lost that. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. But as a, as a college student, I, I want to say this because it jumped out at me when you said, as a college student, who was praying to God now? Mm. Who was praying earnestly to God? God mm -hmm. spoke. If you hadn't been, then Amen. today you'd be doing something completely different. So, Amen. so y your parents had inculcated into your faith. You made it your own. You were praying to God. You didn't know as much about the books of the Bible as you wished, but based on where you were, you had a real faith with God where you were praying and seeking God's will. Amen. And as a young person, God said, I'm calling you. Amen. Did it frighten you? Did it encourage you? Did you, oh, great. Or did you say, <laughs> oh, have mercy, here's a responsibility. How'd you feel? Well, honestly, I feel like I've been unpacking that chapter for the rest of my life, and I hope I'll continue to unpack it the rest of my life. Yeah. But at the time, I just felt blessed because it was a promise. I mean, it could have been one of the ones like, you know, I'm not listening to you because God, God actually is quite annoyed with the people in that chapter. Mm -hmm. early Cry on. aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, show my people their transgressions, the house of Jacob, their sins, exactly. talking about the true fast. Exactly. Yeah. So I praise God that he gave me the promise. Fantastic. Well, somewhere along the line, I mean, a little further down the line, you end up leading an international organization that is pouring into people and making a huge difference. We're going to talk about that in just a second. I am glad you're here. My guest is Joy Calvin from Farm Stew. We'll be back with, our, with more of our conversation in just a moment. This is brought to you by It Is Written. More and more people are watching It Is Written TV. They're watching their favorite It Is Written programs, listening to inspiring sermon series, and much more. They're watching them here, here, and even here. See for yourself why people are turning to It Is Written TV 
to watch their favorite Christian programs live and on demand. Watch It Is Written TV for free anytime on Roku, Apple TV, and at itiswritten.tv. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. My guest is Joy Kaufman, who is the director of Farm Stew. A minute ago, God spoke to you and said, you're gonna be doing something. This is the burden I placed upon your heart. Time went by. Now, the birth of Farm Stew, what happened? How did that come about? Well, it's also a long story, but the short version is that God allowed my husband and I to have some success financially and we had become donors to another organization. And then once you become a donor, then you get put on the board, right? Uh -huh. And so I was on the board of an organization that cared for uh, agricultural projects in developing countries, and it was a Christian organization. Fantastic, yeah. And one of the staff members, and I had become friends, and she called me and she said, hey, would you like to go to Uganda? And I was like, sure, I've loved Africa for a long time, but I was always too frugal to, to actually go and spend the money on my own ticket, sure. my own immunizations and everything. I always sent money to organizations like this one. And she said, well, the federal government is looking for volunteers through a program through USAID, United States Agri, or yeah, US Agency hey, for USAID. International Development. Yep. Yeah. There we go. Anyway, so they said it's farmer to farmer program and you could go for three weeks and serve as a nutritionist. And I was like, that sounds pretty cool. And by this point, my kids were like 13 and 10. And I thought, you know, it's time for a mom's day out, a little missionary yeah. moment for mom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I went in 2015 and my assignment was soy nutrition, developing uh, products and recipes and working with local people using the soybeans that they were already growing, uh -huh. but teaching them how to prepare them in a way that would be more nutritional for their families and also adding some value to them so they could sell them at a higher price instead of just selling them off as a commodity at a yeah. very low price. Yeah. So anyway, I went and I was just smitten. I'd never been to Africa before. Isn't it amazing? Yes. yes. Just amazing. And the yeah. places where I was going was like going back in a time machine about 3,000 years. Yeah. I mean, there would be a plastic chair here and a cell phone there, but everything else was things that could have been around during Bible times. Right. And the people, you know, being a nutritionist, like generally in America, people sort of know what they should eat and yep. they may or may not choose to eat it. But they basically know, right? We've got the food pyramid and the whole thing. Yeah, yep. exactly. And. So you're not like that popular in a crowd, right? Because <laughs> people don't really want to hear what you have to say. Right. But over there, it was like people were coming out of the woodworks, just so excited about this hands-on cooking class that we were doing. Okay, now I'm going to jump in here. I, I know we're getting to the formation of Farm Stew, but I know what somebody is thinking. Africa. I mean, if you're not thinking poverty, you're thinking stuff grows. They had soybeans. Soybeans are good for you. If they had soybeans, they had other good things. Nutrition problem solved, Joy. They <laughs> grow a bunch of green stuff and eat it. Where's the problem? Well, the problem in the case of soybeans is that they were just roasting it and serving it like a little crunchy corn nut. Sure. But you don't give that to a kid with no teeth. So one of the worst times of malnutrition is they call it the first 1,000 days of life. Mm -hmm. It's from the first day of conception through the second year. Uh -huh. And particularly vulnerable is that time period from six months when a mother's breast milk is no longer sufficient. And so the weaning food often in Africa is a corn porridge. Yes. And it doesn't have any protein. So the soy, if you can teach them how to make milk from it, or even just you know, make it into a soft porridge, a boiled porridge, or add it to the corn, add it to sorghum, add it to millet, other you know rich African grains, yep. then you can prevent malnutrition right there. So what you're saying is they have l enough food yeah, and still there's malnourishment because that food isn't being prepared in a way that really is for the benefit uh, of themselves. Exactly. Which is a fascinating thing, isn't it? You got enough food and you're still malnourished. That's that's a whale of a problem. It's a huge problem and it's it's, Throughout so many parts of the world, the poor are eating starchy staples, white rice, white corn flour, white you know, wheat flour, cassava, which is basically a white starchy staple. Sure. All of those foods metabolize in our system as if it's table sugar. And so you're talking 
very little micronutrients like vitamins and minerals and a lot of quick glucose into your bloodstream. Uh -huh. So even though they don't have the problems with diabetes as we do, diabetes is growing in those countries yeah. because they're just basically eating table sugar. So what do you see as a result of that? So kids are getting food, food that's nutrient poor, even though I'm thinking soybeans, yay, but they're not prepared in a way that's really gonna help them. Well, and they, they weren't actually giving the soybeans to the kids. They were selling it more like a cash crop, sure. like coffee, tea, sugar, okay. soybeans. You know, they didn't know the value of what they had in their hands. So what do you see as a result? What do you see in the people? What problems are they experiencing because of this? So, well, a lot of people are dying early. I mean, we know, particularly Seventh-day Adventists, the, this eight to 10 extra years, they're getting into the 90s, right? Well, yeah. the average lifespan in most of these African countries, Sub-Saharan Africa is in the 50s. Yeah, that's worrying. And so it's not just that they're all dropping dead in their 50s, it's that these children are dying. And so when a children dies, that brings the total number down. I, see. Yeah. I mean, they're also dropping dead earlier in their later years as well. But you well. get all these kids dying, then the average lifespan is much, much lower. Exactly. So, exactly. so, so they also get like diseases, like yeah. skin diseases, their hair is red, their hey, wait, wait. tummies are big. Red hair is good? Yes, actually your red hair yeah, looks yeah, great. <laughs> but wrong kind of red hair, I'm guessing. Yeah, a black kid should have black hair. Yeah. And when it's red, it actually is a sign of protein deficiency. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, what, what causes that? So it's protein deficiency. Yes. And these black kids should have black hair, their hair is rust colored because Very it's, thin. and you go. Yeah. So when, when you go there and you, you, with a nutrition background and a public health background and you see the people, automatically do you think, oh, I'm seeing problems, or did you have to, was there an education process first? So there is an education process because the biggest problem that's affecting like one in three children in Sub-Saharan Africa and also one in three children in Southeast Asia is called stunting. Yes. So it's a hidden malnutrition because it's hidden because unless you know the age of the child and the appropriate height for that age that they should be, you can't tell. But this short for their age, there's no problem being short, but when you're two standard deviations off, that's yeah. an extreme shortness. And what that impacts is the rest of their life. They have a higher rate of all sorts of diseases, a lower intellectual capacity, and lower in earning potential for life, 20% mm -hmm. lower in earning potential. So that's one of the ways we try to impact the, the parents is that we say, you know, do you want your kids to be able to take care of you when you get older? Oh yeah, that'll motivate them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we, we utilize the Bible, like we talk about Daniel and his friends and how they got this diet where they were eating all sorts of vegetables and mm. pulses, which is another word for beans or legumes. Some, the uh, King James Version uses that word, and I like to use that word to make the point about eating beans because yeah. they have a lot of protein, not just soybeans, but any kind of bean. Yep. So we, we say, you know, look at these kids in the Daniel example. They were 10 times smarter, you know? And so wouldn't you want your kid to be 10 times yes. smarter? So we use the Bible throughout all of our lessons to try to motivate behavior change and a heart change. So you were there with the, with the USA trip, and and then what? Well, I was an undercover missionary. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I went to church and I had asked to, to go on the Sabbath and I actually met some people at the church and they were very intrigued with what I would, was doing. And in fact, so much so that one of the people, they, he was a soy entrepreneur, his name was Stephen and his sister sat and translated for me. And he said, can I volunteer with you? So myself and the translator, we went out and we went out to the villages the next week. And the next week they had me preach at that church. And then the following week they had me preach at the city central church. How about that? So suddenly this nutritionist who, you know, nobody wants to talk to at a party because I might criticize what they're eating is like <laughs> this, you know, local phenomenon in Uganda. And it was really exciting because I was using the Bible you know, Genesis 129, for example, I call yeah. it God's dietary guidelines. Mm -hmm. You know, he told us to eat this whole foods, plant-based diet right then yeah. and there. Yeah. So, so, so you, you saw this, you were fired up and immediately you thought, oh, I must start an organization or how'd that happen? <laughs> I actually didn't think that. I didn't want to start an organization, but I knew that after three weeks, I had to go home and, you know, be a mom for yeah. my own children. Yeah. And my heart was just aching again because like I had seen kids in the villages that I knew weren't gonna make it. Oh, really? Yeah. And yeah, that's hard. It's horrible. I mean, you see the poverty and you see just this eagerness. I mean, 
if you boil a pot of beans for a bunch of kids in America and you start passing them out, they probably most of them would not, you know. They didn't want <laughs> pass. They didn't want we soaked and boiled these soybeans, which was in and of itself surprising for them because they'd never soaked the beans, which activates the enzymes and makes the nutrition available. Wow. And then we passed out just simple beans. And these kids were just like lining up like, I mean, it was as if it was, you know, the best thing that ever happened to them getting yeah. these beans. So I yeah. thought, okay, God, I can't just go home and forget about all these kids. And so I was wrestling with the Lord, what can I do? And I was trying to prepare materials, training materials, so that I could leave them with people and they could continue the training. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, one night in the hotel, and it was, honestly, I don't hear super, super often, although the more I listen to the Lord, the more I have those impressions that I know. But this was another one where it was audible. Audible. And, and God said, hire the local people. And That's I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. So I had to figure out what that meant. And so for the next week or so, I was like starting to talk to people and try to figure out, you know, what would the wages be? And I was doing all this kind of secretly because I didn't want to tell the people that I really actually felt like I should hire. So I was talking to people at the hotel and trying to go talk to other organizations in the city so I could figure out how they were doing things and yeah. how I could do things. And then the big day. <laughs> what was the big day? Well, I went to the Sabbath on my last Sabbath there, and I had told everybody I was leaving the next day. And they had me preach, and then they had me do a full seminar afterwards. And on that day, I hadn't told anybody what I was thinking. And there was a young woman named Fiona, who I write about a lot. She's still a trainer with Farm Stew. Mm. And at the time, though, she was this 21-year-old visitor at the church who had just gotten baptized two months earlier. And she said, I want to be part of your team. And I was like, what team? How did you know I'm supposed to form a team? How interesting. <laughs> and so I talked to her for a little while and I thought, this is interesting. And then I was teaching the class and I said, you know, who knows how to make soy milk? And out in the villages, nobody had ever heard that you could make milk out of a bean. Mm. It was shocking to them. But there was one woman, her name is Betty. She's also still with us. She raised her hand and she said, I know how to make beans. I, I know how to make milk and I know how to make soy meat. I said, who is this woman? Really? <laughs> yeah, and she had been trained at Bogema University uh. in hotel and restaurant management as an Adventist university. She knew all about the soybeans and the recipes. And I mean, she took it way farther than I ever could yeah. in those three weeks. So they were two of the three first hires. And I was working at the health department in Illinois at the time. Uh, just part-time. I was still raising my kids. And I felt the Lord tell me that I needed to start sending my wages over. So that was the first year of farm stew. <laughs> wow. Now, I, I want to ask you this. So you roll up in an African village and you say, no, 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 you're doing it all wrong. I want to show you how to do the soybeans. I can imagine that people might shrug their shoulders or even feel a little resentment. But evidently people bought in. Why, why was it that there was this readiness among them to say, show us what to do with these beans? We've never done this before, show us. Explain the openness. You know, I was honestly as shocked as you are because oh, yeah? I, I felt like it was gonna be rather presumptuous for me to come and tell them how to cook. And then, you know, as farming, I thought these are subsistence farmers. They have to know how to farm. They That's how it. they survive. Sure. You know, who am I? Random white lady shows up, you know. Yeah. I had the same feeling. and. But honestly, they're very, very interested. First of all, these cultures are very intrigued by visitors, sure. as you know, yep. right? Yep. Yep. Especially visitors with this skin That's color, right. I have to say, we're very interested. Oh, look, I just love it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gathered together at the end of a service and I'm praying and I feel, my eyes are closed, and I feel this little touch on my hand and I open, open my eyes, these little black kids are stroking my white skin, smelling. See if the whites can smell. First white person they'd ever seen. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, they're int they're intrigued by visitors, and so that's a, that's a responsibility and an opportunity that you have as a, as a visitor like that. Absolutely. I have a slightly better story on your story though. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I was leading a class that first time I was in Uganda. 
I was standing there leading a class and the kids had come in and like pressed in and they were so close to me that one little kid was petting my toes <laughs> 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 while I was trying to teach. It was a bit distracting, but I didn't want to like kick him or anything. No, no, no. <laughs> he was so intrigued by the whole yeah, concept of fun. white toes. Yeah. But um, anyway, yeah. And I mean, even I was there last month. I was in four different countries in Africa last yeah. month. and. I was in villages, three different villages, where they said, you're the first white person that's ever been here. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, and I mean, it's kind of surprising, actually. Yeah, but, but what I realize is most people, when they go to Africa, they'll go to a city yep. or even, I hate to say, but like our church leaders, they might go to the headquarters. Sure. But to go see like rural poverty firsthand, it, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of intentionality. It's hard to break away that's because right. you have so many schedules and that's demands right. and people all around you. So so you started hiring locals. And w when did you realize an organization is needed? Did you realize that right away? No, actually, I was hoping and praying not to start an organization. In fact, I tried to get It Is Written to take it over. <laughs> I remember. If you recall, I met you when I, about six months later, I went to Zimbabwe as a health evangelist. That's right, there we you. were together. Yes, and yeah. I had this secret plan that It Is Written was somehow going to take the project over so that I didn't have to become the administrator of a big organization like you. <laughs> well, you know, that would have been great. But God worked out the way it was supposed to be worked out because with your passion and your drive and your entrepreneurship and all of that, uh, the Lord knew what He was doing. Yeah, I praise God, but it took me a while to really decide, okay, Lord, I'm really supposed to lead this thing. People were responsive. You started to see results. Absolutely. Tell me what you saw, like before and after picture. Yeah, so, well, I'll tell you a recent one, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just being there this past month, I was in Uganda, and I went into this village, and these women were literally singing this song, and the chorus of the song was, Long Live Farm Stew. Oh, come on. Yeah, it was really cool. Of really? course, it was in the local language, so I can't sing it for you. <laughs> oh, too bad. But it was, it was just so beautiful, and they were just giving the testimony of the fact that they can now feed their children the men were testifying on, we have savings clubs, which by the way, I never said the actual meaning of the acronym. No, no, and I'm, I want you to do that. I realize that. Yeah. So we have savings clubs, we have nutrition, we have farming, of course, is the first letter. Savings club, I think that that's self-explanatory. That's really interesting. It's so important because there's no banks out in these areas. Right. And the money lenders that come out when people need money, predatory. they take, yeah, predatory is the right word, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the acronym, come now. Okay, so yeah. it's farming, yeah. attitude, rest, and meals. Yes. And then that's farm. And then stew is sanitation, temperance, enterprise, and water. So some of those letters might be familiar from other health messages, yeah. but a lot of them have a different spin on them. And enterprise, that's a fascinating one. You know, one of my professors at Johns Hopkins said, the very best thing you can do for anybody's health is create a job. Yes. And I believe it. Yes, yes, yes. And to get people out of poverty, you get them into work and you get them enterprising. Well, sorry, being, be, being enterprising and off they go. They become self-sufficient. Absolutely. Doing something for oneself is much better than doing this. Yes. On, and Sister White says that. She says, you may give to the poor and injure them because you teach them to be dependent. Instead, teach them to help themselves. And then she says, the needy must be placed in a position where they can help themselves. Mm. And that's what Farm Stew is intending to do and successfully doing in yeah, so fantastic. many cases. So you started in Uganda. Yes. And Farm Stew began to grow. And now you are where? We are in South Sudan, Uganda, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, uh, launching in Cuba. Brazil. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yes, it's it's growing. I could keep going, yeah, but God yeah, is yeah. good. It's and and really, this recipe, we want to share it with anyone throughout the world. I want to ask you more and more specifically. We'll drill down about some of those countries in just a moment. I'm just fascinated. This is a wonderful success story. God has been a blessing and continues to bless Joy and the life-changing work that she's doing. She's Joy Kaufman. I'm John Bradshaw. This is It Is Written, more of our conversation in just a moment. You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about studying the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious as well. 
Well, here's what you do if you want to dig deeper into God's Word. Go to itiswritten.study for the It Is Written Bible Study Guides online. 25 in-depth Bible studies that will take you through the major teachings of the Bible. You'll be blessed, and it's something you'll want to tell others about as well. itiswritten.study. Go further. itiswritten.study. Welcome back to Conversations. My guest is Joy Kaufman from Farm Stew. You, uh, we, we mentioned a moment ago, you're in numerous countries now. Uh, you weren't always, you know, you start somewhere. Where, where do you see this going? You, you mentioned a dozen countries, a couple more coming online. Do, do you see the amount of countries just growing and growing and growing? Do you think we're gonna cap this thing off at 15 or 20? I'm not, I'm not saying what's the definite plan, but what, what do you see, what's possible here? Well, thanks for asking. Our, our mission is to share the farm stew recipe. And when I say the recipe, I mentioned before the eight ingredients is what we call them, the yes. letters in our acronym. And so we have actually this manual, oh, yeah. um, a, a 400 page manual that shares the details of how to farm, how to have a positive mental attitude, how to prepare whole food plant-based meals um, in a context that's very resource poor. And this here, you would give that to whom? This is for trainers. And we also have it online, like on our farmstew.org website. You can just click on the recipe and anybody throughout the world can take the course for free. Oh, fantastic. So let me ask you, so I'm in Malawi. My friend is in Uganda and his friend is in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. This, when I say translates, I don't mean languages. This works across cultures. The principles work kind of wherever you are? Absolutely. Oh yeah. Yes, we've really made it very international and very basic. I mean, it's simple, simple things that yeah. you can do. For example, how to purify contaminated water. Okay, sure. You know, um, and how to check for malnutrition, how to create an enriched porridge so those children from six months to two years don't have to get malnourished. Mm. So very simple things and very adaptable. And we keep it in a very simple language, like more of about a sixth grade mm -hmm. reading level so that you know people can train this. And, and we want it to be in the hands of Bible workers, of yeah. church leaders, women's ministries, health ministries. You know, we, we have our own trainers in different countries that we've hired. We've also partnered with other ministries yes. where we're you know, working together with them, making this curriculum available. So like, our, we just feel like time is short. Yep. Jesus is coming. Kids are dying, and Jesus is going to ask them and ask us, what did we do for the least of these? And I want people to have a good answer. And mm. I believe Farm Stew is a good answer, and that we're, we're solving a problem not just for the poor, but we're also solving a problem for the wealthy, because they want to know, how can I make a difference in the world? Yes. And this will mobilize church members to do that. I have so many questions for you, Joy. Uh, you mentioned South Sudan. I'm so fascinated by that challenging place. It's a war-torn place. There's lots and lots of conflict there. So the question is, how do you select your countries? Maybe they select themselves. And then how do you go into a place like that and present options that people might not have had when, when, there's, when there's conflict? So, okay, how do you end up in South Sudan? I'll just ask that question. Okay, so that's a beautiful story because we went to the head of the Uganda Union. This was five years ago. And we said, you know, where should we go next? And they said, our poorest people are in the refugee camps in the north. And those happen to be people from South Sudan. There was sure. about a million refugees. Oh, well. Wow. So we actually had the blessing. I mean, God has been so throughout this program. I, I haven't talked about the miraculous hand in so much of this, but God allowed me to meet a couple named Edwin and Jen Dysinger. And they're an amazing family. The whole family is amazing. But they, I met them in Uganda one night in a hotel, and they were with this woman named Doreen Arcangelo, who happened to be uh, help. They'd known her for 20 years. And she's also the wife of the president of the Church of South Sudan, mm. Pastor Clement. And Clement and Doreen are this amazing couple. Doreen was working as a women's ministry leader in the camps. And so she came to the training I was having the very next day at the Uganda Union. And she was like, give me everything I can learn, you know? So we sent her with a book, we sent her with flash drives, we sent her with seeds. She went up and started working in the camps. And then about six months later, I went up to the camps with her and we did a training. And she said, 
and her husband came and he said, we need this mm. in South Sudan. Mm. And so praise be to God. And, and, you know, God has provided through very generous donors and he allowed us to move into South Sudan. We're now in eight different states. I was just there last, last month actually. Mm. And I mean, where the farm stew workers are, the church is thriving. Pastor William, he's uh, the president of the field. You'll like this name. Wow. It's W-A-U, but it's <laughs> said, pronounced oh, we like that. wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it is a wow place because it's, it, the, the poverty is extreme. But like I was in the home of a woman named Mary. And, you know, she, I, I met her out by her field where she is planting a farm stew field. Mm. And literally, they don't have a well yet. Farmstu has drilled 71 wells in the last three years, mm. but they don't have a well yet. She's, these little boys were getting water out of this muddy pit, slippery, slippery pit, three boys having to move this buckets of water up the hill. And that's how this woman is watering her garden. Wow. But then she took me to her house and she had had the benefit of farming with an ox plow, which is like just this tool that you put behind oxen. Yep. They can dig up a hectare of land, which is two and a half acres, they can do it in a day. Without the plow, it takes them two weeks. Oh, wow. And so they're digging up all this idle land, you know, and, and they're harvesting. And Mary took me to her house. It was this little hut, <laughs> you know, out in the middle of nowhere. And inside this hut was just bags and bags and bags and bags of harvest. So much so that she had to build this little platform in the hut so that the hole all the way up to the top of the thatched roof was full of the bags of her harvest. Really? Now, wait, this is, this is farm stew harvest? Yes. Okay, so, so three years before this, what was her harvest like? She, I mean, she, like most South Sudanese, were basically starving. And now she has this abundance. She's, she's got to figure out ways of keeping it all. Yes. What's she going to do with it? Well, she's storing it. She's yeah. smart because we taught financial planning and everything through enterprise. So she's storing it. She's not selling it right away when the prices are low. She's waiting ah. and she's a grandmother. So, I mean, her grandkids were following her home and I have pictures I'd love to share. They're just amazing, these kids, you yeah. know. So she's, she's now being this matriarch for her family and How helping wonderful. them survive. Yeah. And, and she's a church member, you know. What, what, what's a farm's you garden? So a farm stew garden has three or more types of vegetables. So that it has to have an orange type of vegetable for vitamin A because the kids are often deficient in vitamin A, which yeah. reduces their immune system and makes them more likely to die when they get a small And, and what's illness. an orange vegetable in Uganda? What's so that? like pumpkins okay. or they have orange flesh sweet potatoes. You know, mm. our sweet potatoes are mostly all orange, but right. in Africa, they're mostly white. So they're lacking the vitamin okay, A. Okay. We well, also encourage like mangoes and papayas. Yeah. And then you can also get vitamin A from leafy greens. So it has to have three or more different kinds of vegetables. Right. And we use like the parable of the sower and the seed, you know, the four types of soil. Yeah. So in most subsistence farmer gardens, there's not a separate path where you do not plant here, you walk here. Yeah. And then here you plant and you don't put your feet. So that distinguish you know, like Jesus taught this parable, we often spiritualize it, but there's actual practical farming lessons in there. Interesting. So we yeah. teach, you know, cultivating the soil so you get rid of the rocks. And then when the weeds grow up in the third kind of soil, you know, those are the thieves that are coming mm. to kill, steal and destroy mm -hmm. your harvest. So you have to weed, you have to cultivate, you know, and then if you do that, you're gonna have this abundant harvest. Like and these right. principles weren't known? No, sadly. Yeah, and you know, I'm going to say that that's going to be a surprise to a great many of us who thought, well, Africans have been farming forever and they would have had this all figured out. But I guess you do what you know and it's simple, simpler and so forth. What I believe is that they probably were much better at farming back in the day. Yes. They also could forage for a lot of natural foods, but you know, <clears throat> the population is growing, so there's more pressure on the land. Mm -hmm. And then honestly, when corn came in in the 1960s, a lot of people gave up the traditional farming methods okay. and they adapted corn, which there's a whole long story for that, but it came from the Americas and it has kind of taken over Africa. Sure. And it's not as nutritious as the traditional African grains. And then also there's kind of a prejudice against farming, like it's a job for poor people. Oh, interesting. And so there, I think there's probably a lot of ancient knowledge that has been lost. And so that's one of the things we try to cultivate is, you know, what did your ancestors eat? Mm. Often they ate healthier diets than the current modern day diet. No doubt.
Oh, really interesting. So, so I, I know you care about people's health. And I, obvious, you're a nutritionist and you have an MPH and so on. But I know you care about people's soul. Amen. Their souls. So make the connection here because I, I know you don't do this just to have healthier people. You want to have people who know Jesus and know him better and have a shot at everlasting life. H help me see where this connects. I mean, I could, I could, I could assume it. I want to hear it from you. Yeah, absolutely. So I remember that day when I was on the trampoline and I was reading about certain health messages and, and you walk up to somebody and you say, you need more fresh air, exercise and sunshine in this country if they have a desk job. You know, they're happy to hear that. It's, it's helpful information. But if you walk up and you say, I come in the name of Jesus to an Ethiopian woman who's just walked three hours. You were just in Ethiopia. Yeah. You know, they're walking for three hours to go get contaminated water. And you tell that woman, you know, you need more fresh air, exercise, and sunshine. Yeah. And by the way, drink lots of that water, yeah. even though it's contaminated. You know, you're not helpful. And suddenly the gospel that you're bringing is no longer relevant. And when you look at what Jesus did, I think his mission statement was when he went to the synagogue, he opened the scroll of Isaiah, and he read, you know, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, and free the captives. So if our gospel is not inclusive of news that is actually good news to the poor, then I don't think we have Jesus' full holistic gospel. Mm. And so for me, farm stew is a way of sowing the seed of the word of God into ground that makes it ready for the harvest. You know, it's ready to be planted in because we're not putting in barriers that, that make us somehow cold and heartless sounding <laughs> to the people that we come to serve. I have two questions, but I, I, the, the natural question I have to put on hold because I wanna ask you this while we still have time. And that's kind of the, the philosophy that undergirds farms. Do you talk, talk with me about that? I know you wanted to reach hearts and, and better nutrition and so forth, but I, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's a philosophy, some guiding principles. If there are, what are they? Yes, yeah, so I would say John 10, 10 is our theme verse. And I often quote, you know, that Jesus says that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So that's why we call Farm Stew the recipe for abundant life, nice. because it's Jesus. But then I always ask people, do you know the first half of that verse? I'm sure you do know Pastor John, <laughs> right? So the first half is about who? Mm. The now thief I'm interviewing cometh you. not, <laughs> but for to kill and to steal and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Exactly. So the thief is killing, stealing, and destroying. And so many people, including people in the Western and affluent world, they don't believe in God because they look at the suffering in the world. Yeah. But let's put the blame where the blame is due, which is on the thief, and let's be working on the side of Jesus, which is abundant life. And so for me, as a convert to Adventism, that's the great controversy right there. And honestly, if we're not on the side of working for abundant life, and we're just passively accepting this idea that there's, you know, three billion people on the planet that can't afford a healthy diet, two billion people on the planet that don't have clean water. If we're just passively accepting that as if it's okay, I, I really question whether or not we truly love Jesus and whether what he's gonna say to us in the end. Are we gonna be the sheep or the goats? I wanna be a sheep. Yeah, amen. Yeah, there's a, there's, that, that puts it in, in stark terms, doesn't it? Um, you mentioned the church and church leaders. So you, you, you're, you're a Christian and you're sharing these wonderful principles and you're seeing the church responding how? Honestly, very, very warmly. You know, we had to prove ourselves, which is good because you don't want just any random person that thinks that they have a new health message, you know, sure, <laughs> to just be right. able to pop up. And that's right. so they, they had to really check us out. But I will say, I just received a, a letter of endorsement from Pastor Clement, the president of the Church of South Sudan. And he was not only appreciating what we've done, not only endorsing the fact that it has been good for the local churches, but he said any ministry throughout the world, any church leader throughout the world that has the opportunity to partner with Sparm Stew should do it. Oh, that's exciting. What a wonderful endorsement. It was very exciting. Yeah. And actually, Pastor Rugori, who's the head of the East Central Africa Division, he told me a few years ago, Joy, this is your division. I want you in every, every country in my division. Oh, fantastic. 
But honestly, we need more help. We need help getting the word out. We need we need the, the church to embrace it in such a way that they will incorporate it in with their health ministries, with their Dorcas groups, with their women's ministries. We have a gift and we want to offer it. And, and it does cost money to send out trainers, buy seeds, buy ox plows, help repair wells. When we get the community up to a certain standard, yeah. then we offer them a well. And you know, we can't do that everywhere without everybody kind of pulling their weight and getting involved. Yeah, so if somebody wants to get involved in Support Farm Stew, how do they do it? So farmstew.org is our website. And so there's a big purple in the corner donate button. And so that's a great way. We also invite people to pray and we also invite people to learn the recipe themselves, to, to be able to learn for themselves, and they can share it in their own context. So let me, let me ask you a question that maybe you haven't been asked a thousand times, or maybe you have. In their own context, somebody lives in Akron, Ohio, or they live in Bangor, Maine, or they live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. They say, well, I, I ain't going to Uganda. <laughs> How can a person who doesn't live there Right. Incorporate some of these principles here. Is that doable? And if it is, how? Absolutely. So I love that question. And I actually had the opportunity to teach at a camp meeting last summer. And it was of people that were preparing for like country living and that kind of thing. And, and just, you know, knowing that things might always not stay exactly as they are now. Yeah. And I taught using this manual. And I said, after I teach today, if you want to keep the manual, great. If not, you know, throw it back in the box. But if you want to keep it, you know, throw your money in and, and we'll, you can take the book home. They all took the book home. Really? They all found it very relevant. Now, of course, we have, you know, flush toilets and running water, but we not, might not always have that. Right. You know, but even now you can use your garden for evangelism. You know, like some of the Bible workers up in South Sudan, they'd been trying to teach people the gospel. People weren't interested. But suddenly they planted a garden and everybody came. So that, I've done that in my own house. Put a garden nice. in your front yard, not your backyard, so yeah. your neighbors will see it and you can converse with them. Just fantastic. Five years from now, what are you gonna be doing? You'll be leading farm stew. What do you think it'll look like? What do you, what do you hope it'll look like? What do you hope it'll look like? <laughs> wow, I just hope it continues to be used by God and that this recipe, this knowledge that we have to share is saving lives both in the here and now and more, and more so even for eternity. My guess is 10 or so years ago, or maybe even less, you, you didn't realize or, or, or wish, I don't know, did, didn't know you were gonna be leading an international organization and here you are. Does it fit okay? Is it working all right for Honestly, you? I love it and it has been one big surprise after another. Nice. But God just keeps surprising me and keeps opening doors. Being here today is one of those doors. I, I praise God and I thank you for sharing your listening audience with me because what a privilege. Well, we thank you for sharing what God is doing with you and through you and through Farm Stew. We wish you every success. We're just, we're proud of you and happy for you. And it's wonderful to see that God is blessing, Amen. touching lives and pointing people to Jesus. Joy Kaufman, thank you. Thank Be you wonderful. so much. And thank you. I'm so glad you took a little time to be with us here. Um, of course, if you go to itiswritten.tv, click on conversation, you can watch many of our conversations and you can watch this program with joy again and again and again. Hope you will. And I hope you will share it with others and let others know what God is doing in such a profound way in many countries around the world and in a growing way also. Thanks for joining us. I'm John Bradshaw. She is Joy Kaufman from Farm Stew. And this has been our conversation. Mm -hmm.